Shalom and welcome to Biblical Faith with Sam Peek. We invite you to join us as Sam brings a study in the Torah from the Jewish sages. And now our speaker, Sam Peek. Shalom Aleichem. Peace upon you. Welcome to our program. Stay with us. We're going to try to study. We're still looking at the Aleph Bet. We're actually on the letter Bet now, the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And we had just finished off in the last lesson or the idea of how the functioning of the universe and the functioning of, well, we'll just look at nature right now. We won't talk about uh, the spiritual universe. We'll just talk about the physical one. The functioning of nature in the physical universe is actually, it's dependent. In other words, I don't want to say dependent is the only factor. That's not the only factor, but it is influenced. We'll put it that way by what you and I do as human beings. And we looked at the, at the two things, you know, bait, this, this letter bait is the letter of duality. Uh, it's uh, the, num uh, the letter that uh, stands for two as far as numbers go. So it's the letter of duality. And we were looking at how, how uh, it talks about even inside of us, there are two forces. And this is something actually New Testament students and readers should be very well acquainted with. There are two forces. In Judaism, these forces are called the Yetzer Hatov, the inclination to do good, the inclination to obey God, to act as we should, and the Yetzer Hara, the inclination for evil, or the inclination to disobey, put it that way. Uh, well, no, that's not really it either. We can't just say it's the inclination to disobey because the Yetzer Hara, and by the way, in the New Testament, this is the idea of, of the flesh, uh, is usually the way it's talked about, uh, is... Uh, also, things that are necessary for us are connected to the Yetzer Hara. Things uh, such as uh, uh, the, the uh, desire to eat, okay? This is part of the Yetzer Hara, to survive in this world. Uh, all the survival instincts, if you will, to uh, reproduce yourself, to procreate. In other words, all of those things are part of the Yetzer Hara. And they're perfectly fine as long as they are in control of God. As long as, as long as your Yetzer Hatov, your spiritual nature, the spirit that you are, is in control of, of the situation. Okay? And the idea in Judaism is to make both of these things, both the Yetzer Hatov and the Yetzer Hara, both of them together, opposites though they are, both of them coming together with the Yetzer Hatov being on the top, both of them coming together and working in the will of God being obedient to the commandments of God, being obedient to Him, and thus both of these things serving God together. And this is the same kind of idea we find in the entire universe around us, actually. Okay, all right. Now, that brings us kind of up to where we were. And we want to go, we want to look at uh, what Rabbi Monk, Michael Monk, is saying about this. He says, he says, the proper functioning of nature is contingent upon man's capacity to overcome the duality of his nature, what we just said, by support, subordinating his inclination for evil to his inclination for good. Then he says, in accordance with the, cov with the Creator's covenant. Now, it took me a while studying this to actually understand what he was talking about. He quotes Jeremiah 33 and verse 25. Let's look that up. It's, uh, it's quite an interesting verse. Jeremiah 33, I said. Yeah, 33 and verse 25. It says something quite interesting. It says, Thus says Hashem, If not for my covenant, and we have to put a comma there, because he says, If not, im lo briti, if not for my covenant, and we have to stop and think, He's, going, he's fixing to say day and night, and then he's fixing to say, I would not have established the statutes, the laws governing heaven and earth. Uh, in the sense of, I think, both in the sense of spiritual and physical, but right now we're just looking at, at the natural world around us. Okay. If not for my covenant, and the way this is going to be interpreted by the rabbis when they come to this, they say, it's not that God is making a covenant with day and night, it's not that he's making a covenant with heaven and earth. The covenant that he is talking about is literally the Torah. Uh, it's the word of God that comes forth that creates all of these things, okay? So if not for the Torah, if not for, and they'll go on to relate that to the covenant that God cuts with the nation of Israel, with the people of Israel and the Jewish people. 
So, and all of these, by the way, are contained in the text of the Torah. So, if not for the Torah, then there would be no day and night. And God would have never established the, the uh, laws of physics, the laws of the creation that govern uh, the universe around us. He wouldn't have done it. Uh, then he goes to Leviticus, Vayikra, chapter 26, verses 3 through 6, and quotes, and quotes a, 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 a very important verse concerning this concept. And li listen to it. If you walk in my laws, he says, and you observe my commandments and fulfill them, then guess what? I will give your rain at the exact moment that you need it. Because you know if rain comes too early, it can be a disaster. If rain comes too late, it can be a disaster. If no rain comes, it can be a disaster. If too much comes, it can be a disaster. What God is saying, if you walk in my laws and observe my commandments, if you are obedient to me and fulfill them, then I will give your rain in their due season, the right amount at the right time, exactly. And the land will yield its produce. In other words, these are the laws of nature that God has put in force. But what, what is it being contingent upon? It's being contingent upon if you walk in my laws, if you obey my statutes and fulfill them, if you listen to me and obey me, then all of these things, all of these laws of nature that uh, when, I, when, when uh, God created the universe, all of them that He's put into motion, He makes them work exactly right for you. The rain comes at exactly the right time in exactly the right amount. The land yields its produce. The trees of the field yield their fruit, it says. And that verse ends in verse 6. It goes on through several things. But it ends in verse 6, And I will give peace in the earth, in the land. I will give peace in the land. All of that contingent upon obedience. That's pretty, pretty neat. Now, Rabbi Hirsch, another rabbi that we've talked about in here many times, Rabbi uh, uh, Shimshon Raphael Hirsch, Samson Raphael Hirsch, a very great rabbi, he, he puts it in a very interesting way. He says, if God's law is observed, then nature functions undisturbed. Do you see what he's saying? God put all of these things into motion, all of the laws of the universe into motion, in for what? For what reason? For your benefit, for my benefit as human beings. That's, that's really what it's all for. I, uh, uh, we'll see that more and more. Okay, he puts all of it into motion, and it's all going to operate correctly if you and I operate correctly. But if we don't, if we are disobedient, if we allow the Yetzer Hara to come and rule our life uh, so that we are completely disobedient and we are, we are breaking uh, every commandment that we can possibly break and, and thinking, and you know, a bad thing about the Yetzer Hara, the evil inclination, is, that, is what we know today as uh, rationalizing. The Yetzer Hara seduces you, <laughs> the way the rabbis put it. It uh, rationalizes everything. Ah, oh, it's not such a big sin, it will tell you. Ah, God doesn't really care. It's okay. He, he'll forgive you anyway. So what? You know. And uh, a ra rationalization around it, in other words, and the Yetzir Hara seduces you. If that happens, then guess what? The, fu the, the functioning of the natural world, the functioning of the universe, for that matter, is out of sync. It, uh, it becomes disturbed, if you will. Something interferes with its proper functioning. That's, that's something. Anyway, Rabbi Hirsch goes on. He puts it, he says, every seed pushes its way through the ground. Every blossom blooms. Every fruit ripens. The sun's rays shine. The dew falls. But the purpose of existence is shattered when human society, he's saying everything works good when we're being good, but it's shattered when human society undermines its purpose by moral and social degeneration. Then things go crazy. He says throughout Scripture, he says, and by the way, if we don't believe it, look at the Scripture and look at the history of the Jewish people. And we see, he says, how providence regulates nature in accordance with man's action upon the earth. Now, if we think about that for a minute, it's true. When Adam sins, 
not just Adam is cursed, the earth is cursed. The creation itself gets a curse for that. In the days of Noah, what had happened in the days of Noah, every living thing, the human race, had corrupted its way. And as a result, had def the, the, the idea in the language is that it defiled the land. It defiled the earth itself. So what, God, what does God do? He koshers his pot. He boils it in water and makes it kosher again and starts over so he can use it. Uh, uh, in other words, it affected actually all of the creation. There's a passage in the New Testament somewhere, and I can't think exactly where it's at, but uh, uh, where this Rabbi Paul was talking about, uh, he says, um, how does he put it? The whole creation groans, he says, waiting for the manifestation, he says, of the sons of God, which is the, the end of the redemption. In other words, when everything is redeemed and everything is put back exactly like it was at the beginning. The creation groans for this. Why? Because our sin affects the creation around us. That's the whole idea. Okay? Uh, let's see. Rabbi Monk says, the blessings of childbirth and rain. Now, it's interesting. Uh, both of these things, he's getting one from childbirth in Adam's account and the other one rain in Noah's account. He says, are conditioned by man's conduct and not by just the mechanical laws of nature. Nor, oh, this is Rabbi Hirsch still saying this. Nor by any meteoro meteorological <laughs> weather forecast. I'll use an easier word. Okay. Thus, he says, by observing the Torah's guidelines in inner harmony. I hope we're getting this. By observing the guidelines of the Torah in inner harmony, a man causes the numberless forces of nature to function harmoniously. He says, when man contemplates the wonders of the universe and above all realizes that nature is not just an unvarying machine, that we have an effect on it. And not only do we have an effect on it, but it is under the constant direction of a good Hebrew term here, hashkaka. Hashkaka is what we would think of in English as uh, providence, you know. Uh, God's overseeing all things, a uh, providence. He begins to realize, he says, how great the master of the universe must be. I want you to get this. Let me, let me read it again, and I'll not make any comments. Let's read it, because I really want you to get what, what uh, Rabbi Monk is trying to get across to us here. He says, by observing the Torah's guidelines in inner harmony, man causes the numberless forces of nature to function harmoniously. When man contemplates the wonders of the universe and above all realizes that nature is not an unvarying machine, but is under the constant direction of the hashkacha, the providence of God, he realizes how great the master of the universe must be if he, the master of the universe, can take into account the deeds of an individual human being. You see what he's saying? God is in control of all things. He is in control of the enforcement of the laws of nature, all of those things. They're all in his hand. All of them come about. It's not a mechanical process. God is actively involved in all of those things. How great he must be if he looks at the way you're living your life and the way I'm living my life and takes that into account in the laws of nature. Whoa, that's something. That's actually something. He says, it is in this sense that the writer of the psalm proclaims with awe, and he quotes from Psalm 92, the 92nd Psalm in verse 6, how great are your deeds, your works, your deeds, the things that you do, Hashem. He says, that is the sense of what he's saying. That's something. Thus, the letter bait makes man aware of the duality and the pluralism of Bria, creation. And this awareness, once we begin to be aware of this, then we ourselves infuse the creation with bracha. Remember? Bracha, a blessing. Okay. Let's go to the board. Let's go to the board. I really should have walked over here at the very start. We were actually kind of finishing up <laughs> the lesson before with that. We're looking, we're still talking about the letter bait, the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Now, I want to, let me erase some things here because... We need to write. We want to look at the structure of the letter itself. 
And the structure of the letter itself is going to tell us something. And remember, this, the letter bait, I shouldn't have erased Bereshit up there. The letter bait is the very first letter of the Torah. It's the letter of creation. It is the letter that God begins to speak the Torah and to speak everything into existence. Okay? Uh, Rabbi Monk points out that it is the bait of creation. At its upper left corner, do you see here? Right here, in this, this spot right here, it points up. It points up to what? It points up to heaven. It, uh, and this is Rabbi Monk's explanation of this, that it acknowledges the existence of the Creator and testifies that the marvelous intricate patterns of nature and the universe did not come about by chance, but were woven by the one God. Now he goes from the top of the bait to the bottom to its base. It sits on a base like this, and it must protrude here. Uh, we have other letters that don't protrude back to the back, but this one must protrude. And why? Because remember, Hebrew is written right to left. So it is pointing back to the first letter, the Aleph. It points to the heavens to recognize the Creator, and then the base of it literally points back towards the Aleph. And remember what the Aleph is? The Aleph is the one God, the absolute oneness of the one God. Uh, he says, uh, they didn't come about by chance, but they were woven by the one God. The base of the bait points back to the Aleph, the letter that symbolizes God one, God's oneness. Now, look at his conclusion of this. Let's read his conclusion of this. He says, this indicates to us, and oh, this isn't Rabbi Monk's conclusion. He is quoting another rabbi, a rabbi called the Malbim. Okay? I know, I just threw another term at you, but uh, that's okay. You'll get used to it. Uh, Man can best achieve an understanding of God through the study of his creation as represented by the bait. Since it is impossible to comprehend the Almighty in his essence by pure intellectual prowess. Do we get what he's saying? It's, a, it's actually a very profound thing, what he is saying. Let's walk back to the board. Let's walk back just a moment. And let's work on this idea of what he is saying. What, how in the world does the mild beam come to this letter and, and notice these two things? It points upwards to the heavens in recognition of the Creator, and it points, and it, that's its top part, but its base also, what it rests on, what it stands on, points backward to the Aleph, which is representative, is number one, the one God, the, the letter of divinity, the letter of God Himself. How, what's he saying here? And then he says, so that means that we can best understand God by uh, our, our, is that the way he puts it? Yes, best achieve an understanding of God, not, not the highest understanding, I don't think, but, but best achieve an understanding of God through a study of his creation as represented by the bait. And then he makes this comment, since it is impossible to comprehend the Almighty, God himself, in his essence, only by pure intellectual prowess. We must have faith. If faith is not involved, if we go just by pure intellectual prowess, then it can lead us into all kinds of things like saying, oh, well, there is no creator. If we don't look and acknowledge the heavens, and if our, and if our base, if our foundation is not pointing backwards to this olive, then it is very easy to say, actually, it's not easy. It's very difficult. We have, to out, we have to step out of ourselves almost, I think, to say, okay, so there is no creator. There is no supreme being that brought all, everything into being. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, one day uh, there was, a, there was a, all this concentrated mass of gas and dust and all this stuff, and it exploded. And because it exploded, all the universe comes to existence, and, and, uh, and things just happen by chance. And... and uh, yeah. It's, 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 uh, it actually takes more faith to believe that than to have your base, your foundation pointing, back, pointing to God and your head pointing upwards to the heavens to, in, in acknowledgement of Him. That takes more faith to me. But what this is telling us is that without faith, then just pure intellectual study can lead us into crazy things like that. 
can lead us into crazy things. The bait has a foundation, has a base that points to God. And there has to be a faith element involved, by the way. Uh, you know, some, sometimes, look, sometimes people are constantly uh, after me sometimes. Explain this, explain that. Uh, give, me, give me this uh, explanation, rationally explain this, rationally explain that about God. And to tell you the truth, uh, so, sometimes that's, that's uh, not available to us right now. It's not, it's not uh, or hasn't been found at least. I don't want to say it's not available because I'm a very firm believer that in the text of the Torah, in the letters of the Torah, is everything. That everything is there. All the secrets are there. All the, uh, it, it, it is a complete and total and perfect revelation of God Himself, and everything is there. But do I understand it all yet? No. And have I found it all yet? No. And will I ever find all of it, even in eternity? Probably not. But sometimes we have to have faith. Uh, and, and that doesn't mean to, to believe something uh, without an understanding of it. That's not what I'm trying to tell you. What I'm trying to tell you is that there are some things that we come to in fact, even looking at the creation around us, even looking at the natural world around us, that we have to have faith in the one God in order to understand it, in order for it to make sense to us. Okay, let's get off that subject. Let's go on. We talked uh, in the last program, I think, about how in the very beginning of the text of the Torah, and we won't, we won't do it again right now, uh, but the bait that begins, the first word of the Torah, Bereshit, is enlarged. And there is a big... Uh, always a big study. Anytime we have a big letter or we have a small letter in the text in, of any of the biblical books, it's always there to tell us something, that's for sure, to give us some kind of information about what's going on. And uh, it says the Torah starts with an enlarged bait in Bereshit in the beginning to stress the fact to us that, that of all the letters of the Aleph Bait, God chose this particular one with which to create the world. Now, let's give a little story from the Midrash, okay? Uh, from the homiletical commentaries uh, on the Torah. The Midrash comes and tells us a story. And it's going to be, it's going to illustrate something for us. It says that, it says, all of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet are inscribed on the crown of God. They are there. And when he was about to create the world, all of these letters descended. They came off of his crown, and they assembled before him. And each one requested that it be used for the beginning. All of the letters, by the way, are used for the creation, but one, every one of them wanted to be the first letter to be used for the creation. But they started in reverse order. They started at the end of the alphabet. First, the Tav. That's the end of the alphabet. Came. Uh, it made its claim on why it should be the letter to create. And in the Midrash, we would be here a long time if I gave you all of the story because every one of them has a reason on why it should be the letter to create the universe. And finally, but finally the bait comes forward. And when the bait came forward, it said, please let the world be created with me because all beings will use me to bless God. We remember. Bait is the first letter of bracha, blessing of God. I find it interesting that the bait sound is B also in English. And in most of the languages, uh, there will be a B sound that begins the word which has to do with blessing God. So, he, so God immediately <laughs> accepted that claim and said, so shall creation begin. So he takes the bait and uses it as the first letter of the creation. Now, there are, there are other different, you're, you're going to find other different explanations also. Let's go on with this story. We'll finish this program out with this story. After the bait was chosen for creation, the Midrash continues to tell us, it says, the Aleph, the very first letter, withdrew from competition. It didn't even want to give its explanation of why it should make a claim for itself. And in God, instead of letting that be, he asked it. He says, well, why did you remain silent? Why didn't you say something? And the Aleph responded, and he said, in the face of the other letters, I can make no claim, for all of them represent plurality. Bait is two. That's more than one. Gimel, the next letter, is three. Uh, that's plurality. That's, that's uh, more than one. Anyway, 
He says, all of them represent plurality, a number more than one, while I am only one. Since God had already decided to create the world with the bait, why did he even ask the Aleph for the reason for its silence? And the uh, Midrash comes to tell us that the Aleph was left with the opinion that, a, that in a world that was to be created with bait, which stands for plurality, there was no place for the unique and godly Aleph, which represents the one God. To rectify that erroneous belief, and it's a, it is an error, God said to the Aleph in the words of the Midrash, Aleph, do not fear because you stand at the head of the alphabet like a king. You are one and I am one. It is my intention to create a world for only one reason, and that is to put my Holy Spirit in it. This will be accomplished through the Torah, the unique, one-of-a-kind Torah, which I will give my people, Israel, the one-of-a-kind people. When I present them with the Torah, I shall begin with the Ten Commandments. And those Ten Commandments, by the way, we saw when we were studying the Aleph, start with an Aleph, as it is written, Anuchi. Uh, I am Hashem, your God. So when he begins to speak at the revelation at Sinai, he begins with the Aleph. Very interesting story. We wanted to end this lesson with that story, with that uh, uh, illustration, if you will, that comes out of the Midrashim and how important the letters of the Aleph Beta are and the things that we can learn from them. I hope you're enjoying it. I think we're learning some very important principles. As in the words of Rabbi Monk, the wisdom that is found in the Hebrew alphabet, uh, the sacred letters as a guide for Jewish deed, for Jewish thought first, and then deed. But I want to tell you, not just for Jewish thought and deed, for your thought and deed also, I hope. I hope they will make a difference in your life in the way you think about the Holy One, blessed is He, in the way you think about the Torah and everything. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have. Shalom of Raka, peace and a blessing to you. Thank you for joining us in our study. If you enjoyed this study and are interested in learning more from the Torah and the sages of Israel, then check us out on the internet at www.bfm101.com or you may contact us toll free at 1-800-639-0169. Our mailing address is Biblical Faith, P.O. Box 2, Abilene, Texas, 79604. Until next time, we wish you Shalom Uvakah, peace and a blessing.